some of you we haven't seen in a while, but uh, good to see you all. We are we're here doing our inaugural uh, GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee Industry Partnerships Subcommittee meeting. So we had our first uh, subcommittee meeting yesterday with the acquisition workforce, had a really great uh, start there. And so we're going to do our, our first meeting for the industry partnerships. Um, we have quite a few folks coming in today. We have both uh, subcommittee members and then we have a couple of guests. So I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. And then I've got some slides I want to share. Here we go. So the first thing I want to say is, again, thank you for coming. I am the designated federal officer. So we'll have some members of the public here. I just want to make sure that um, you know who we are. Stephanie, you want to say hello? Good day, everyone. Right. Uh, so we are part of the, the GAP fact, the GSA Federal Advisory Committee meeting, the Chief Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory Committee, and we are operating under the Federal Advisory Committee Act rules. Um, the key things about this uh, way of operating is that we are we have a balanced mix of members here from many sectors of, of our uh, economy. And as we work in, under a FAC environment, we are maintaining objectivity, transparency, and making sure there's going to be independent advice. This committee is a discretionary committee and is providing advice to the GSA administrator. So we're following this long tradition of engaging uh, experts uh, into different fields to provide advice to the federal government. To give you a little background on the committee itself, we actually chartered this committee back in July of this year. And the committee itself is, is following a, a path here of focusing on what we can do to encourage, enhance the work uh, that's been done to embed climate sustainability when it comes to federal acquisition. So we have this great opportunity here through GSA, a uh, great mix of uh, talents and skills in this subcommittee, but also the committee at large, there's 28 members for the total committee. For this subcommittee, we have 14 members. Um, we launched uh, our first meeting on September and we started with three subcommittees. This is the industry partnerships subcommittee. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had our acquisition workforce subcommittee meeting and we're having one for policy and practice tomorrow. So the members of the subcommittee are here. And what I'm gonna use this list now, right now is to give me an opportunity to do a roll call and just to establish a quorum for us to proceed with the meeting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call your names for the members of the subcommittee. And then I will just um, just ask you if you would just say present or um, you know whichever way you can uh, describe that you're here. So Kristen Siever, our chair. Present. Right. Farad Ali, our co-chair. Present. All right. Denise Bailey. Okay, um, Gail Bassett, Nicole Darnell. Present. All right, uh, Susan Lawrence. Okay, Daryl McKissack. M Mamie Mallory. Stacy Smedley. Nigel Stevens. Present. Okay. Anish Tilak. Present. Heath Tillich. Here. Uh, David Wagger. Present. All right. And Kimberly Weiss. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, and Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm counting seven right now. We need eight to have a quorum. So let me see if I missed anybody again. So let me go over the names that I missed just in case. Um, Denise Bailey, Gail Bassett, Susan Lawrence, Daryl McKissack, Mamie Mallory, 
Stacy Smedley and Kimberly Wise. All right, so we are one person short. Boris? Boris? Yes. Look quickly. I see Kimberly in the room. She's muted. Okay. So she may need to unmute uh, for, for her voice to come through. Okay. If you see Kimberly in the room, well, that's good yeah, enough. She said she was going to be on a train listening. Okay. In. Yeah, All I'm right, here. So. so sorry. I'm here, but I'm just on mute. Gotcha. Okay. We do have a quorum. Thank you. So we can go ahead and continue. Um, I wanted to go over a couple of uh, ground rules before we get started. So we have a number of guests here today. We also have some members of the public who had joined to observe the meeting. Because we are operating under the FACA rules, just wanna be clear that this is a meeting for the subcommittee members of the industry partnerships subcommittee. And so the, the chairs and co-chairs, so both uh, Christine and Farrar are going to facilitate manage comments. And then the meeting will be recorded and we're going to provide the, re the recording of this meeting on our website so that you can access. But as members of the public, we're gonna have a time during the meeting where you can uh, add comments. We have here two minutes, but that'll be the discretion of the chair and co-chairs. Perhaps there's more time depending on how many commenters we have. Uh, and so there'll be an opportunity to do that later on in the meeting. Uh, and then the other thing I wanna say is we have opportunities for you to comment uh, in writing. Uh, we have established um, a regulations.gov docket where you can go in and, and actually put comments that are related to our activities. And we also have our website here, which we have in this slide here. So we have a number of ways for you to engage with us. Uh, but anyways, I just wanted to, to go ahead and get it started. And what I'm going to do it now is I'm going to turn it over to our chairs and co-chairs for the Industry Partnerships Subcommittee. So Christine and Farad, back to you. Great. Thanks, Boris. Um, just so and we have a deck we're going to share for that discussion to kind of get us started. I think he's going to call that up. So, hey, I want to welcome everybody and thank everybody for um, getting on and just making the commitment in advance to be on, on the full committee and then the subcommittee. Um, you know, looking at our diverse backgrounds, I think, you know, our diversity will be our collective strength as we move forward. I did have the opportunity to sit in. I, I'm a member of the workforce subcommittee yesterday. And as Boris mentioned, we were getting some informational uh, presentations. And really kind of brought to light the, the scale and scope of the problem that we're just trying to help solve a small part of. And I think it really brought around to me the clarity and the importance of the work that we have to do. Um, and I think how we go about our work and bringing focus to what we're going to recommend will be really important. Uh, I think the other thing is, you know, really the value of public input. I think part of our role might be to ensure we help broadcast and get as much public input as possible over the tenure of our assignments here. I think that will help us um, guide us and inform us in uh, bringing the best recommendations up to the full committee. Uh, so I think that's really important. I oh, sorry, if you can go back. Um, I think, you know, we're, as I said, I was looking at our background. Some come from science, some come from industry, some come from academia. Uh, so I really am looking forward to everyone bringing uh, their unique skill set to this committee. I, I can tell you I'm an engineer, so I can help bring a lot of process. Um, and I think process will help us stay on track. It'll help us make the most use of our time. Everyone has so many responsibilities. I want to make sure we're very thoughtful about uh, not overburdening folks with administrative details and that we can really move quickly. But we also, as a committee, want to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that we're refining our focus and really getting into those things that can create impact, uh, recommendations that you know, the full committee can decide to bring forward. Um, and that, that's really my last comment is it's really important that we stay aligned with the full committee, but really when you think about what's going on across workforce policy and industry partnerships, we'll have to stay aligned within each, uh, with what each of those subcommittees is doing. So we can do that a couple of ways, you know, the, the sub chairs meeting with the chairs, I think also, um, those of us that are on multiple committees, and I think most of us are on more than one committee, 
you know, really thinking about, okay, not only is what is our work, but how does this potentially impact uh, another subcommittee so we can um, make sure we stay in tune with that. So with that, I'm really excited about today. I'm going to hand it over to Farad and then I'll come back to how we're going to scope these meetings out over the next uh, few weeks. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. We're really excited about seeing this group. We really do believe this is going to be an important work for us to go for, for, further and farther with we're helping GSA. Um, we did have, when we first came out with, you know, 12 um, steps in that partner subcommittee topics. Um, you all may have seen those. Um, we took some time, Kristen and I, to meet earlier and felt like it was important that as we start discussing some of these things, um, we look at the background around process and other parts of it is really around sustainability. And we felt like there's some intersectionality between the committee work, between our work and the workforce and, and the other groups. So we said it was important that we begin to figure out how, when we're doing our work and our industry partners, how that coalesce into the policies and practices and also works inside of the workforce subcommittees. And um, I think Kristen covered it well around how there's some intersectionality and how do we make sure that we're able to maximize that cohesiveness in our work um, but again, Kristen, not, Kristen being very process oriented and we had a decide, discussion is that we didn't want to do anything without the full committee support, acknowledgement and engagement. So um, that's where we're at today. So we've got these opening comments and thoughts that we wanted to go forward. And we wanted to make sure that everyone in the subcommittee could speak up or speak out and ask that you, um, you speak on issues that you have thoughts or concerns about simultaneously use the chat um, if we need to come back to them and address those. Um, and one of the things we're hoping to do is to have our committee chairs to be able to debrief with other committee chairs on, on a regular basis so that we can make sure that as we swim down our lanes that we're all swimming to the wind and we're not swimming east and west, but we're all swimming north and south. Right, uh, I love that, swimming to the wind. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I would, I would say, you know, certainly we want folks to chime in, we want uh, this to be a very interactive session. So uh, you can use the raise your hand, you can just chime in on audio, whatever, whatever works, we'll make sure we stop. So we kind of have like a very loose framework for how we're going to have the meetings going forward, and we can interchange this as needed. So but I envision, you know, we'll have a chunk of our meetings where we can do committee business. Um, and that's what part of the official meeting public meetings are for. And then we, we really definitely want to make sure we have good speakers lined up um, to help inform us of what's going on with this whole initiative, what's going on within acquisitions, how we can this will really help us refine. Um, and then we definitely want to make sure we have enough time uh, for public input. And depending on how that goes over the next couple of meetings, we can we can revise this kind of format based on that. Uh, so even for today, I know our speakers, uh, we're going to get them on uh, before 3.30 because of their time commitment. So we may have to come back to some of the other business. Um, but we have a few minutes. So if we can go to the next slide, Boris, please. Uh, let me just stop there, though, and see if there's any comments from anybody on the subcommittee uh, before we get into kind of a road mapping visual. We good? Okay. So one of the things is this is like a massive undertaking and it can, it can get overwhelming, I think. Um, so one of the things I wanted to kind of lay out for folks is where are we in this two to three year time horizon? So if we think about it, we, we know we have a full committee meeting. We're trying to get that, I believe, scheduled for January 12th. So that, that's kind of a deliverable date for us. And so prior to that, we'll have three public meetings, one of which is today. And in between the public meetings at three o'clock on the same day, Wednesday, we will schedule um, administrative meetings and the entire subcommittee will be invited to that, understanding that everyone may not be able to attend based on schedules, but it will help Farad and I kind of stay on track uh, uh, working with Boris and team, but we'd love as many folks that can make that in the in-between weeks to please uh, feel free to dial in and join. And I think, you know, just chunking this out, I wanted to kind of just socialize this with the committee, you know, what we want to accomplish in these next couple of sessions prior to the full committee meeting. So I think, you know, for me, one of the things that's important is that we organize our work and how, how we're gonna go about doing our business. 
Um, we discussed really deepening, making sure we're clear on what is the subcommittee's mission and expected outcome for the full committee. Uh, as uh, Farad said, we don't want to be swimming east or west. We want to swim to the wind. I love that. Um, I definitely need everybody's help in identifying potential speakers. Boris, uh, thank you, helped us identify speakers for this meeting and for the next meeting that, that are really going to give us information to help inform us uh, as we start to scope out recommendations. So we will create a Google Docs uh, and it'll be in there and you can just add uh, speakers, uh, who they are, what, what they would bring to the subcommittee and we can try and work on getting those lined up. But we definitely want to have a docket of speakers for every meeting. Um, and then lastly, our real work is to make sure we go through this list of priorities. And we, we have time for that later today. And we want to make sure that we're able to refine that list and bring forward um, not final recommendations, but really our narrowed focus on what are our priorities going to be as a committee um, going forward. And we would like to be able to curate that and bring that forward for the January 12th meeting. So let me stop there and um, see if we have any comments or discussions or Farad, any further comments on that? No, for, no further comments. Okay. Is there, are we missing anything as far as, you know, I want you guys to think about is, a, that might be too much, or are we missing anything important that we would want to get done by the January 12th meeting? I'm not sure I understand. So oh, that's my watch talking, sorry. Okay, so um, I think this is doable for us. It's, it still is a lot of work given the time of year it is, but I think we can, I think we can get this done going forward. Yeah, and I can speak for just from a full committee perspective. I think this is spot on for for what we're looking forward on uh, on the twelfth, and and so so far the meeting is it's a go for the twelfth. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's good to know for our calendars. Thank you. Okay, let's just go ahead to the next, and then I think what we'll do, Boris, is um, I think the next um, yeah, I think we if it's okay with everybody, if we have the speakers ready, I'm I'm open to. I know they're sensitive to time. If they're ready to go. Should we pivot here and let them get started? I, I think that's a, a good idea if, if you know if nobody and then we can come back to the, the discussion. Yeah. I, I think that would be good. Is that okay um, with the rest of the group? We can do thumbs up. Okay. You can do thumbs up, you could do hand, you can do something. Just let us know because again, we want to make sure we're not doing this as a variety Christian show, but it's really the group's discussion. Okay, so what, what I like to do is um, just be it since we have a little time. Maria, if you're around, would you mind just doing a, a brief intro for our speaker since we have the opportunity? So I'll, I'll give it to you. Sure, Boris, let me just adjust my view here because uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, I'm Maria Swaby and I'm the GSA Procurement Ombudsman. And, and I'll be presenting to this subcommittee at the next meeting on the function and its role in industry engagement. But for today, I have the honor of introducing the two presenters from ITI. The first is Gordon Bicco, and he's the Executive Vice President of Policy for the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI for short. I don't know why they don't have the C in there, you know, initials, but that's fine. <laughs> I'll find out from Gordon and Megan later why that is. Anyway, Gordon, he leads the association's public sector portfolio and serves as a chief policy strategist for the technology industry in the government and public sector market. Megan is, Peterson is ITI's vice president of policy, public sector and council. She works closely with ITI member companies to develop and advocate for positions on policies, legislation, and regulations governing acquisition, and um, as well as other functions. Um, both Gordon and Megan began, um, I'm sorry, both Megan and, and, and Gordon, before they worked for ITI, uh, worked at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And um, if you want some more details on their backgrounds, uh, you could definitely check out their bios on the ITI website at itic.org. 
But I just want to say personally that as an ombudsman, um, part of my role is to engage with industry on a variety of different topics and in a variety of different ways. And Megan and Gordon are true industry partners to GSA, as they're always willing to engage with us whenever we ask and in whatever form we ask them to. In fact, I'll say this, uh, for the vast majority of time, they're the first ones to respond to any requests that I have. And I normally have, have had quite a few over the last three years. So we truly appreciate them and their generosity in giving of their time and expertise. And the presentation they're about to give is a testament to that. So without further ado, I turn it over to Morgan, Mo uh, Megan and Gordon. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, again, Megan Peterson uh, with ITI. Maria, I have no idea why we don't use the C, but we don't. <laughs> I'm going to take that back, uh, take that under advisement. Um, first of all, wanted to give an opportunity for my boss, Gordon Bitko, uh, to, to say you know the first opening remarks if you'd like. Otherwise, Gordon, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, just really quickly, Megan. Maria, thank you so much for the kind words. I think it's because anybody who's anybody is a three letter agency, right? It's it's GSA, it's not GSA and something else. So we want it to be a three letter trade association. Uh, <laughs> number one, that would, that would be my guess. I, I have no idea. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, just really briefly because I see Jeff Costas is online. Jeff, congratulations on the presidential rank award could not have been more deserved. And with that, uh, Megan, over to you to jump into the presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for spending some time with us. Thank you for inviting us. Um, we gave a version of this presentation to GSA procurement execs um, and some representatives from the FAR Council. Um, turns out it, it was unbeknownst to us, but a few days before the recent uh, climate related FAR case was released. So we've updated the presentation um, given that great information in the rule. Um, so, as Maria said, we're with the Information Technology Industry Council. We are a trade association. We have 80 members, and they represent global tech companies. Um, we have the full spectrum of companies from cloud service providers, hardware and software providers, um, a lot of services providers, um, and you know, really the gambit of members in terms of what constitutes the information technology industry. So that's exciting because it gives us a lot of diverse perspectives. Um, and when we do presentations like this or come up with these types of ideas, we really have the benefit of hearing from the breadth of the tech sector. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is something that's been in the works conceptually for quite some time. We, uh, at least I in particular, was a, a contracting officer at the FBI purchasing IT products and services for several years. Um, so I'm looking at you know, sustainability as uh, a lot of the government agencies are through an acquisition lens. We're seeing you know, not just in this area, but throughout um, the various policy initiatives, there's always a procurement hook, always a procurement angle. Um, so that's been exciting to track the implementation of these various policy initiatives and requirements through the federal contracting process. Um, so pretty much as soon as uh, we received the um, climate-related executive order from President Biden, we began thinking and talking with our members about how the government would implement some of these initiatives within the federal acquisition process. And uh, Boris, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So a little bit about how, how we got here. Why, why is this so important to ITI and our members? Um, not sure if you're familiar with the Council of Defense and Space Industry Associations, or CODSIA, but that is a multi-association, multi-sector group that ITI is a part of. Um, and if you were tracking the previous FAR case, 2021-016, minimizing the risk of climate change and federal acquisitions, I'm told that the government received something like 35,000 uh, plus comments in response to that FAR case. Um, but ITI actually led the drafting of the CODSIA multi-association comments in response to that FAR case. Um, so that was sort of our first foray in terms of engaging with the federal government. And our comments really focused on encouraging the government to leverage existing standards, leverage existing initiatives that industry is already, already doing, avoid implementing something new, 
avoid requiring really a one size fits all approach to sustainability because we really believe in talking with our members that there are a lot of different ways to get to sustainable and the government should be open to considering a lot of different inputs in defining um, what sustainability looks like in terms of their federal supplier base. I should mention we are in the process right now of leading um, an additional CODSIA multi-association comment on the recently released FAR case 2021-015, Disclosure of Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Climate-Related Financial Risk. So we're diving in a little bit deeper on some of our early recommendations, and we've already gotten a tremendous amount of feedback from our member companies. Um, everyone is watching this very closely and has a lot of ideas that we're excited to share with you. Separately from our public sector policy and FAR regulatory work, I'll mention that ITI has an affiliated uh, organization known as Insights. Please don't ask me what that stands for, <laughs> but Insights participates in voluntary consensus standards making processes around the world. Um, so they are independent from ITI. They do a lot of work in contributing to the development of um, global and industry, voluntary consensus standards, best practices, et cetera. Um, they've been involved for a long time in some of the more recognized global sustainability standards. And so that's something where we're fortunate to be able to draw upon the expertise of insights and our separate standards making arm when we're formulating some of these recommendations. I'll mention that Gordon and I had the privilege of speaking a couple months ago with the White House Sustainability Council as part of their efforts um, to engage with industry, presumably uh, when working towards developing the recent FAR case 2021-15. Um, we learned there, and I just thought I would share because it's it's been guiding sort of our assumptions and our work. Um, it appears the White House Sustainability Council has really been looking at science-based targets as sort of the in-state metric for measuring sustainability. Um, and reducing the carbon footprint. So with that in mind, and given that White House feedback, that's sort of how we've we focused, um, you know, our, our diving into these issues with our members. So now getting to why we're all here, um, ITI has engaged a consultant um, to help us gather data from our members, help us look at the existing regime of standards that are relevant in terms of what members are already using to track their greenhouse gas emissions, how are they reporting, what's publicly available, and really to dive into how can we make this actionable, how can we make it helpful for the acquisition workforce within the federal government. Um, there's a lot of data that is already out there, a lot of data that our members post publicly about their emissions, scope one, two, and in many cases, scope three. So going back to my initial comments, we don't want the government to reinvent the wheel. We want you to be able to leverage existing data that's out there. Um, but we also bring the lens as uh, people who have extensive experience with the acquisition process. We understand that sometimes having that overwhelming volume of information can be really hard for the government to take in as part of the contract evaluation process and really use um, when comparing different proposals, when making decisions about sustainable suppliers. Um, so our goal here was to try to marry um, industry feedback based on standards and best practices related to sustainability, and also with a focus towards practical implementation of giving a tool to federal contracting officers that they can use to start to consider this information in federal procurement. And so the results of all of that, um, and it's still an ongoing process, is we have developed uh, what we're going to introduce today, which is a supplier sustainability scoring model. It is still conceptual, um, but we put a lot of work into it and would love to share it with you and get your feedback on the usability of this as a tool um, to do exactly what I described to arm contracting officers with sustainability information that they need for the procurement process. So Boris, if you could go to the next slide, please. All right, this is just an overview um, that we had shared with GSA and the FAR Council about areas where ITI and our members have already been thinking about considering sustainability in the acquisition process. 
Um, our understanding is that based on the recent FAR case, the government is, um, or at least appears to be, prioritizing these considerations as part of a responsibility determination um, in terms of a threshold requirement for doing <coughs> federal government. Um, that's certainly something that we considered, something that a lot of our members really liked in terms of um, having this you know, threshold determination there. Um, but wanted to point out that our members also raised um, all of the other points on the slide in terms of potential inputs where contracting officers could consider sustainability in the procurement process. Um, so just briefly, you all can read you know, the slide, but um, you can sort of bucket these into the pre-award phase, um, you know, where you're reporting this info in SAM. Um, you could also uh, bucket this into the contract evaluation process. A lot of our members really like the idea of uh, sustainability being considered not just as a responsibility determination, but also as evaluation criteria, where you can really get into um, the meat of this information in a best value trade-off analysis. Um, and then all the way at the end, this could be something that's considered and tracked post-award um, through contract deliverables and performance. So all of that's on the table. There are pros and cons with all of it. And I can dive into any of those uh, inputs um, if anyone has, has questions as we go through. But right now, um, if, unless there are any sort of initial questions, as, as I've set this up, I can turn this into Gordon to get into the actual meat of the model um, and what we've been talking through with our consultant. Thanks, Megan. And thanks again to the GSA team for having us here today. Before we go on to the next slide, just the, the other point that I wanted to make about all this, that we wanted to make about all this is, while 1430 and the, and the current rule focuses on the responsibility determination, it's essentially just requiring companies to be to be clear, to be disclosing their greenhouse gas performance. And that's a necessary step, but it's not sufficient to meet the ultimate requirements of, of 14057 to actually really drive the government to, to net zero and to the targets that it wants to get to. So we certainly come at this with the expectation that at some point the government is going to have to require more than just a responsibility determination in order to to hit those goals to that end boris if you can go on to the onto the next slide really we're where we started in building out this tool this model was the expectation from 14057 from that executive order of of these three goals where progress is required the short-term targets the longer term goal of, of carbon neutrality by 2050, and then the expectation that that's a, a permanent change, that that can't be just a, we hit it and it's a flash in the pan and we revert back to the way we are. We also were aware, as Megan noted from some of our conversations, the focus within the White House and elsewhere in the administration, looking at sustainability about the importance of using science-based targets as a piece of the program. So we factored that in as well into, into the model as we built it out. And th those were really the foundational principles that we looked at when we worked on, on what the model is. Boris, if you can go on to the next slide. So this is a this is a, a conceptual model of what we're talking about. And it highlights one of the reasons why we think that it's necessary to have a tool like we're talking about. And that's fundamentally just that there are so many different pieces to this problem. There are so many different approaches out there to looking at greenhouse gas emission, to doing it according to different standards, to use science-based targets or not, to add on industry-specific requirements or not. On all of that becomes both necessary and important, but also to a great degree, when we look at this from the government side, from the procurement side, a burden. How do you, as a contracting officer, as an agency procurement executive, try to understand all the different things that are out there that might be get it, that might be done by different folks who are competing for for business with the government? And there isn't a simple answer. Fourteen oh thirty, the approach in the rule now focuses on on a subset of this. It highlights science based targets. It highlights CDP and and TCFD as it informs that but it doesn't take into account many of the other standards. It doesn't take into account a lot of the work that other organizations have already done. And it really puts a lot of burden on 
those organizations, SBTI and CDP, to work with the entire government procurement base, the entire government industrial base, in ways that maybe are not scalable. So really, when we look at this notionally, what we're trying to do is to create a, a meta standard approach that at the top says, what is sustainability assurance in a way that can map all of the different work that might be already done by all the organizations that support the US government that are that are trying to be sustainable, that are doing things in accordance with the greenhouse gas protocols, in accordance with SBTI, in accordance with CDP, GRI, and, and others to be to be named later, to be developed later. And understanding that they're all trying to accomplish many of the same things, but they take different approaches, they collect different data, they publish publish different data, and it gets used in, in somewhat different ways. So really what we're trying to do at that top layer of sustainability assurance is, is map across all those. And, and Boris, if you can go on to the next slide, it gives a little bit of a, of a sense of how we thought about that. The idea was then we need to be able to give procurement deciders, procurement executives, contracting officers, whoever they may be, the ability to look at those standards, to not be focused so much on the particulars of any given target, but to look at them in, in their totality, and then to be able to also say, what if you do care about particular factors more? What if in certain areas, in certain industry segments, ultimately we're gonna be focused on, for example, with data center providers, scope two emissions. I'm making that up right now because I don't think we have the data to know that, but the impact to the government's ability to hit its targets is going to vary industry by industry, maybe NAICS code by NAICS code, or some way like that where What's going to be really important for the government to hit its targets might be different for the power generators from the data center providers from the car companies that the government buys from and so on so the idea again was to build a model that allowed us to factor all that in and then the last point on this slide is to note that there is a quantitative component to this there in the end ultimately has to be a qualitative narrative component as well because of the complexity of the of the problem Boris, if you can go on to the next slide. So where we've landed today, the approach that we were looking to take, and for those of you from GSA, this is new information, partly in response to some of the questions and the, the dialogue we had, and we certainly appreciate your, your questions there. They really help to, to focus here. The idea is that there is at the top, at that overall assurance level, a questionnaire. These are notional questions that we pull together and map across a whole range of different underlying questions and underlying content from each of the different components from from greenhouse gas protocol from GRI etc and pull together into in the end a score that you can think of as analogous to a to a credit score you can think of it in that sense where the credit scoring companies are pulling all sorts of data about you from all sorts of different places normalizing it into one endpoint frame of reference that a bank can use to make a decision whether to lend to you so you have this questionnaire with you can see for example the first question is there a defined organizational boundary and a notional score a second question if there's a control approach is that control approach implemented across the organization and it's scored so somebody needs to be able to look at the underlying data and apply the score to it based on the response that if you for us go on to the next page, you can see this is an example of having pulled from the from the greenhouse gas protocol. So here would be the data that a company would have actually submitted through the greenhouse gas protocol that maps to those questions on the previous page. And so there's a score that's related here for GGP based on the relevant questions that tie to the overall questionnaire on the prior page. The, the, the model then maps that score not just to GGP, but if you go on to the next page, to, to SBTI as well. So a company, a submitter, doesn't need to separately do GGP, SBTI, GRI, CBP, CDP, every other scoring mechanism. This model allows for that mapping. It allows for the representation of, you've answered this question this way, and we know how that translates to each of these other initiatives to each of these other sets of criteria and in the end then to a credit like score that allows an evaluator to have an understanding of is this company effectively hitting its goals or not 
Boris, if you can go on to the next slide. So I know that was a really quick overview. I'm happy to go back and get into it in, in more detail if anybody wants, uh, and we can certainly follow up and provide additional content. But this is sort of the big picture of, of where we are on this. We're at the left side. We've started the process of building the model, building this questionnaire, and going into the second Chevron here, into the data collection on a notional level with the expectation that we can pull together all those data to give a representation to GSA or others of here's what the what the data would look like. Here's how it would be presented to a, dec a decider in a government agency, regardless of, of where they sit. And then if, there, uh, if there's success there, if people accept that this is a worthwhile tool, there's a series of steps to go on to get to completion, to go from beyond just the collecting of data to somebody who's an actual accreditor for this process to say, we have these data coming from various sources. We have a, a process that's acceptable to, to an independent organization that can provide that accreditation and can certify that the score that a company has received is, is viable and valid and, and meets the standards that this model is built on. Subsequent to that, there would be a need to actually build out a repository of all the data. There, there's a lot of data here. I think it's important everybody understand the scope of all these different standards is, is very complex. I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people realize that, but when you look at all of them, it's a lot there. And then once that's ready, then, then the model could launch, then it could be used as a tool to provide analysis and ratings to, to presumably to a pilot of early adopters that we could then move forward with the government or with other stakeholders to use a credit score, to use a, a sustainability assurance score as a tool in order to help, again, the procurement decision makers factor sustainability in amongst the evaluation criteria that they've got to look at. So again, I know that that was a very quick review. And if there's anything in there that I explained poorly, please let me know. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody's got. Hey, thank you, um, Gordon and Megan. I didn't know for this scoring system, will there be um, any, is this going to be uh, technology driven by putting in input data and it's going to crank out where you place yourself? Can you give us a little bit more background on the, the functionality of how this would work? Yeah, so for, for a great question, and probably I should have spent a little bit more time on, on that, but it, 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 so it's notional now, and I think that there's any number of directions that we could go in order to provide something that's useful for government consumers and, and hopefully others. But yes, in the end, there has to be a database and the ability to ingest data, hopefully directly from people who are submitting data into GRI or into CDP or into GGP. There's a backend that integrates those data in that maps those data against the questions that we noted and is able to then transpose it to the final score and provide that as an output to a customer. We would have to work out who has access to that. Is that something that it makes sense for a score to be public for everybody? Or is that something that's only accessible to government customers who would be using the data for procurement decisions? I think those are things that we, we we want feedback to know what's going to be most useful. I will say, though, really quickly, one last point uh, on that fraud. Many of our members, our member companies, are interested in tools like this and finding ways that they can demonstrate all the work that they're already doing on sustainability. Because one of the concerns that they've got on the on the FAR rule on 14030, for example, is it requires a specific solution and they understand why, but it might not be the tools and processes that they've been working with. And then there's some significant costs to figuring out, all right, now I've got to move from GRI to CDP, or I've got to move from uh, you know, the, the starter work that I did on, on science-based targets to something that meets the government's requirements for, for SBTI. Yeah, thank you. I was just also looking at how some, if someone wanted to get a debriefing or wanted to disaggregate the data, how could they do that if they want to do that? That's what I was asking. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's another, I think, I apologize, I didn't pick up on that. That's a great question. And I, th I think that this is a, a deeper discussion about where the sustainability ultimately factor into the procurement process. And if it becomes not just the suitability determination, but an actual evaluation criteria, collectively, there's got to be some recommendations about how to do that. And is it sufficient? Do we want procurement officers 
to have that deep dive into the data or do we want to give them just a score because we all know that the procurement officers are faced with a thousand things all the time and do they have the, the time and expertise to dive in and I suspect that the answer is going to be there are some procurements that are so impactful to the government's greenhouse gas budget that that, that yes they really do want to dive into that but for the majority of them probably not right for the majority of them it's important to know we're looking at companies who meet the requirements this certification score tells us the companies that do and that's enough but in other cases we really know that this is an area where if the government doesn't cut its its scope one and two by 30 percent in the next five years it's never going to make the targets and it really does need a deeper dive and i think that's going to come down to the government understanding those which of those procurements that have that biggest impact thank you so Gordon and Megan, thank you uh, for the presentation. I keep getting these presentations and my head starts getting uh, big. Um, so a question I had, so one of our kind of uh, guiding principles is around uh, making recommendations, but keeping in mind like the, um, the supplier pool, keeping in mind inclusion, small business, opportunity business and bringing in innovation. So. When you think as you're designing a tool like this, a metric, I mean, are you giving any thought to those end users that might be inputting here? And could you guide us at all on that? Yeah, um, Gordon, I, I can start if that's okay. Yep. So it is certainly something we have been thinking about. Obviously, um, you know, ITI's members are large businesses, um, but that is something that they are concerned about, especially, you know, uh, if they're serving as an OEM or subcontractor to a small business, it's going to have to report this. Um, so really the goal for the model is that, um, you know, it does provide for like I said, many different ways to account for sustainability. Um, it's not a one size fits all. So if a small business hasn't, you know, built out all of their reporting to a particular standard, they are able to break down and answer these kind of overarching questions that feed the data in and sort of map it for them against an existing standard. Um, our goal would be to have, you know, this template um, available most likely initially as a self-assessment tool. Um, where, you know, it is available to the vendor community so they can see, um, you know, the questions that are important to the government. And ideally, they would have input available, you know, not just for themselves, but for their suppliers um, that they could draw upon and quickly access. You know, we want to make the, the data accessible, not just to the government, but also to small business suppliers. Um, so it's really sort of rolling up and uh, making a usable metric out of what's really a lot of complex data. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, if I can add to, to that just briefly, I, I, I think, again, there, there's an important decision for the government to make on some of these uh, processes, right? The question becomes, does the government wanna rely on things like just a, a company providing data to themselves? Or are they going to rely? Are they? Or, or is the government going to look to standards that require third-party attestations, that require audits, that require additional reviews? And I think there's there is going back to what I said before, sort of a scoping question to think about there, and what's the impact, and how important is it to have consistency versus flexibility for for small businesses and others. One of the ways. Kristen, that we, we certainly want to look to that is, is like Megan said, you know, let's not duplicate work. If, if a small business has done something, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and figure out a way to integrate the work they've done, the reporting they've done, the standard that they've chosen to use, and not force them to go do something else that might require a third party, that might require another attestation. Because there's no doubt we hear all the time, and, you know, Maria and Jeff know that we talk, we bring this up regularly, the, the, the cost of compliance with all of these important regulations is is not zero and it does have an impact on on businesses absolutely and then i have one more question i want to make sure we get everybody who has a question if i understood the model kind of correctly the the different parts of it are going to be determined by the government i.e what gets measured is that correct and you guys are kind of creating a funnel to bring in different data sets and get it on a conti continuity to some sort of scoring um is that do i understand the pursuit 
Yeah, uh, it is the government who is saying in the end, we have these expectations for carbon neutrality and other requirements for, for sustainability. And what we're then doing is saying, these data which come from this scoring system map to that part of the government's output and these data map to that part, but from this other standard, they map differently. These pieces from this standard map to that question and these pieces map to that one. There's not a 100% perfect fit between all of them, but the idea is really to do that as much as we can in behind the scenes so that somebody who has responded who has data in any one standard in any one reporting scheme can be mapped against any other one and then overall be given an assessment uh, against their ability to help the government hit their overall targets. Yeah, and what, one point I wanted to make just real quickly before we continue Q&A is this portion of the meeting is uh, for subcommittee members only. So just wanted to, to clarify that's for subcommittee members. So you have the opportunity. Uh, you, your name, Texas GAPFAC IPS Industry Partnership Subcommittee. Just wanted to clarify there. A good, good conversation, Saparo. So I, I, does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, Nicole has her hand up. Okay, great. I can't see the hands for some reason. Thank you. Nicole, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I really appreciate the presentation, Gordon and Megan. I have a question about whether you have a sense about the general landscape of standards what that looks like among your members. What standards are they using? What percentage are using one standard versus another? And are there patterns that you're seeing in, in which standards are being used? So do small businesses typically use one type of standard versus what some of your other members might, might be using? What can you tell us about this landscape? Uh, great question, Nicole. Uh... A couple of things. One, like Megan said, uh, small for us are still relatively large companies. We don't have any true small businesses that are that are part of ITI. Even the even the smallest are still significant companies, and and would be in the higher thresholds of the sort of scale of business that they do with the government for compliance with the the FAR fourteen oh thirty rule. But the unfortunate answer to your question is, it's a yes, all of the above. <laughs> We don't, we, there isn't a single uniform standard, different companies based on some of them are global and they choose to comply with standards that they think are gonna be more accepted globally or in, or in Europe or in Asia or wherever their markets are. Uh, but there is, there is not a uniform, this is the standard that we wanna use, which is one of the things that led us to saying, what we really need is to come up with a meta standard approach that allows people to, to not do, have to duplicate, but to give them credit for the work that they've done. Let me, let me just ask a quick follow-up. That makes perfect sense to me that a lot of companies also use multiple standards. It's not just one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious to what extent you have your finger on the pulse of whether your member uh, companies are connecting with the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is the new organization that is looking to unify and merge five of the different standards, the largest standards used globally, SASB, GRI, TCFD, CDP, and the like. Do you have a sense of where your members are and their positionality on, on what this International Sustainability Standards Board is doing? Uh, I don't, other than knowing that it exists and they've made mention of it, I, I don't know where they stand right now. Uh, I know that at a macro level on projects uh, like that, they've expressed concern about what you frequently end up with in programs like that is not one standard to rule all standards, but instead of replacing the five standards, you have uh, you know a sixth standard that they've all sort of experienced that behavior in the past. We're we're happy that that's a great question, um, you know, Gordon. I think it makes sense for us to go back and ask specifically about their engagement, you know. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nicole. I see that Anish, your hands up. Please ask your question. Yeah, I think it builds off of the question that Nicole was asking, um, and I'm really wondering, like the the real impetus for having this meta standard, and if you could explain a little bit more how big of an issue this is, and whether you looked at also just having the clarity of moving towards one standard, because you could theoretically just you know set like five years or eight years down the road that all 
suppliers need to meet one standard and that clarity would move them in that direction because the government is such a large purchaser rather than them continuing down their path, which is very splintered. And then the government having to do this meta standard. So just a little bit more information on what the impetus for this. Yeah, so I think it is, uh, it is not clear that the government is the right group to set up to pick a single standard like that for a variety of reasons, right? I think many of our member companies feel like when the government puts its foot down and chooses a particular standard, it actually creates, uh, you know, imbalance in the market and incentivizes behavior that is is maybe not what the right overall uh, outcome is. And so we certainly heard from our members uh, and we've heard from them on a number of areas concern when the government preferences a particular single standard as the approach right when they're when they're in a space where there are already lots of different standards and lots of different solutions so that was uh that certainly is a part of it i think the other thing is is the reality it, it actually goes back to nicole's question um most of our companies are global and are not necessarily going to be driven by the u.s government in particular saying this standard is the one that you need to comply with in order to do business with the with the US government. They really do look at it as why shouldn't why shouldn't it go the other way? Why shouldn't the US government seek to figure out how to engage in and comply with the, the best global standards rather than than the other direction? And again, that's an area where um, it's maybe worthy of a longer discussion, but the government has, we, we, we've seen, and I, you know, I've, as, as, as Maria noted at the beginning, I come to this from the, from years in government service, but the government picking winner, regulatory winners like that hasn't always worked out very well. And, and, and our member companies would prefer approaches that give them more flexibility. And Gordon, just as one, you know, sort of specific example for a, a separate but related effort, um, so ITI has been engaged previously in advocacy related to EPEAT. Um, so right now, uh, FAR Part 23 requires EPEAT registration, um, you know, in the majority of cases when the government's purchasing electronic products. Um, a lot of our members have some concerns with that because it does set up um, what they see in some cases as a barrier to competition. If you're having just this one single standard and not alternatives, um, and particularly not alternatives that represent voluntary consensus standards um, in terms of demonstrating compliance with some of the metrics that the EP registry is designed to address. So ITI is actually, um, we've filed a, a petition for rulemaking um, to broaden that part of the FAR to take out the exclusive reference and requirement for EP registration um, and to move towards compliance with um, multiple voluntary consensus standards, eco labels um, as approved by the EPA. So there is sort of a, a, a competition driver there as well um, of avoiding, you know, just having everything going through a, a single standard. Thanks. Any other hands up? I have a couple of the questions. <laughs> no, there, there are no other hands up, Kristen. Um, before. So I guess I guess one of the questions I have, and this may not you may not be the right people to answer this, but again, you know, we're gathering information about how we can make some recommendations. So uh, you talked about you know representing the large organizations, um, you know, so. Are there similar efforts going on, you know, for the smaller organizations or are the larger companies kind of shepherding them along? Just do you have any insights around what's going on at the broader industry level? We certainly have other associations we work with who represent smaller companies, who represent companies who are who are service providers to the government, you know, sort of lanes of business that we don't work with that we could start to engage and, and get feedback. My honest sense is that the majority of them wait until the regulation shows up before they uh, start to engage. And on the other hand, we're fortunate enough to represent companies who are large enough that they want to try to be proactive on something like this, that they want to talk about the good sustainability work that they do and find ways to, to, to 
actually make an impact. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I just, I, we've been, you've been hearing a lot of questions. Um, again, thank you, Gordon and Megan around. I just wanted to make sure we cover the sustainability side. We do have this obligation to make sure we have people who can participate. And so I think probably um, a more direct question would be um, in this model, are there any opportunities for us to inform smaller businesses or about how to engage with the larger businesses to reach those goals, right? Because if you're doing business with the elephant and we're talking about the, <laughs> the smaller animals, um, we know that we wanna make sure that people know how to help provide a um, value add to the elephant and, and, slaying the, and slaying this opportunity. So can you give us some, maybe some ideas or thoughts on how we can inform that, the group for that? Yeah, I think that uh, there's there's a couple of possibilities for that, and, and and undoubtedly Maria and Jeff and others at GSA are going to be uh, great facilitators for this. But like I said, there are other associations that that we work with regularly that that represent smaller groups, that represents service providers to the government that are, I think organizations that hold forums for their membership, for their members, where you can share that information with them. Um, some of that though, I think also though, comes back to the, the, the mindset and thinking about this and, and, and what is the burden that should fall on the large providers to the government versus the small providers and the, the hundreds of thousands of small providers individually by themselves probably aren't that impactful, but, but the sheer number of them in the end means you have to do something with them too, right? And and the way 14030 is structured, it kind of it differentiates between them to some degree there in a, in a way I'm, I'm not sure reflects that. Um, but I would suggest, you know, if you if you want to make sure that you're communicating that that Maria or others can facilitate communications with some of those other associations who, who really do represent the small businesses and, and other business segments. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. And I think we can bring that back to the subcommittee is, and maybe Boris uh, target some of those for potential future uh, presentations. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like uh, on the next, um, the two weeks from now, when we do the next public meeting, so Maria was coming as well as someone from the Federal Acquisition Service at GSA to talk about some industry partnerships. And we definitely want to think about, I think Megan, you're going to add something you want to Oh, uh, thank you. Just two quick points. Um, so one is that, you know, our goal is, you know, again, by allowing, you know, multiple different inputs to, to get to sustainability, um, you know, you really are providing that flexibility to small businesses. And as Gordon said, you know, giving them credit for progress, for having an internal sustainability plan in place. Um, so, you know, our goal with the model is to not make it exclusive to just large businesses who are already reporting to these standards. Um, the second thing would be, you know, ITI is um, fairly new in our socialization mission uh, with the government. Um, this is absolutely something that, you know, for us to continue to invest in building out, which we hope to do, um, it would be dependent on, you know, feedback from the government, from groups like this. Um, you know, I could see uh, initially, you know, as our next step talking with maybe the SBA um, and some of those other associations, but we're fairly, uh, fairly early on in that process in terms of socializing this with government stakeholders, but that has to be a really key component um, and an action that, you know, Gordon, maybe we can look at too in terms of broadening our outreach. Yeah, I think we would be happy to to collaborate on that. We don't want to get too far out over our skis to use a, a particular metaphor there. Uh, but if there's an interest in, in us communicating either the work we're doing or some of the other messaging around sustainability, that's definitely something that we can we can work with with GSA on. We did last year in April co-sponsor with uh, with with GSA, a conference on data center sustainability, where we pulled in both government and industry speakers to talk about a lot of the issues and challenges and best practices and, and lessons learned around sustainability. So we can certainly do things like that if there's an interest. It's obviously not a small undertaking to, to do, but, but if there was enough interest, we'd be happy to figure out a way to do that with you guys. 
And, and, and I just wanted to chime in here. I know we're getting dropped. Uh, Denise Bailey, is, she's in the meeting. She's one of our subcommittee members, but she's having trouble with the audio, but she put a question on the chat. It's, it's just how do you build access and pipelines for small firms? So just kind of continues that that question. But that was that was a question Denise was posing. You know, how do we how do we build those pipelines and access for the small firms? I wonder if either you can share some thoughts in addition to what we've already been talking uh, about. I, I don't know that we have anything more to add. I think it's an important piece of the mission of, of what you guys need to think about. And we're certainly happy to as we as we build this sort of model and approach out to to engage, like Megan said, specifically with stakeholders who represent small businesses um, and figure out ways to, to pull them into the discussion. Yeah, we do have a, a representative from SBA. He's in the committee, the, the gap pack, but he's in the uh, policy and practice subcommittee, so which is meeting tomorrow. And you you got you both are more than welcome to to observe those meetings as well. But we do have uh, Antonio does. It looks like Nigel has a question. Thanks, Boris. Um, along the lines, uh, not of small business, but minority owned firms. I know. Uh, uh, inclusion and diversity, as well as environmental justice, is a significant priority for this White House um, and has been a, a, a key part of a number of OMB directives. Um, how, if you're going to be doing outreach to SBA, I think that's great. I would recommend also including Minority Business Development Agency over the Department of Commerce. Uh, their, uh, their minority business centers oftentimes work with some of the larger minority owned firms that have capacity to do a lot of this work um, and may, you know, be able to leverage such a scorecard. So how are you, how's the data you collect? And we talked about disaggregating data a little bit earlier. Uh, thanks, Farad. Um, how is the data you collect going to identify or could be leveraged in order to help decide how to reach minority underserved communities, women owned businesses and so forth? Yeah, that is a great, great question. I wish we had an answer for that. It is the, uh, and we don't, but it is the reality that there are multiple different competing priorities from the administration that are all important. And I don't know that they're necessarily intention, but but government decision makers, procurement executives are going to have to figure out ways to prioritize and balance all of those different requirements, right? And um Certainly, the importance of minority businesses and, and DEI is, is clearly and, and rightfully an administration priority. And 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 how do you how does a procurement executive make a decision between a company that does well there or meets their their requirements there, but isn't so good on sustainability versus a company that's the opposite? How do you how do you balance those out? So I, I think that's something that collectively needs to be thought through. And how do you how do you balance those priorities? I, I don't know that there's any easy answer to it, though, Nigel, but it's a great question. And, and it's certainly something where if you think that if we build a tool like this, that collecting those sorts of data would, would help in that decision making, you know, we'd have to talk about how to do that and to do that in some sort of secure and reliable way. Well, I think it would also be helpful in identifying where are the industries where their certain populations are either heavily uh, presented or underrepresented. Uh, where are the areas in the sustainability industry itself, where with regards to renewable energy or uh, recycling and, and environmental remediation, whatever, how do we identify the areas that we have a number of these firms that can be leveraged and utilized, even as a part of your larger supply chain for these massive companies, um, to incorporate them into that so we can know who's where and what they're doing in these various industries. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good point. Um, something we can certainly consider in terms of, um, you know, kind of filtering the model a bit in terms of requirement and specific industry. So we talked about, you know, there is the opportunity in addition to, um, you know, mapping the questionnaire questions to specific international standards. There's also the ability to map to industry specific sustainability requirements. Um, you know, government specific requirements, certainly um, that data would probably be more useful, um, not as much as the responsibility determination phase, but once you get into more of the, the qualitative 
you know, trade-off analysis there. Um, we haven't even talked about, you know, how would this play with uh, with set-asides and different aspects in the procurement process. But, um, you know, the goal would be to, to allow some flexibility for tailoring, um, you know, the data that the model fits out based on industry-specific requirements and areas that you might want to prioritize. I know you, I know you both had a hard stop, so um, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I, I want to thank you for your participation here today. And, um, you know, I think something for us to take back to the subcommittee is that, you know, I'm hearing regardless of how we score, you know, these different priorities, I think it's important that none of the scores kind of block out or interfere with the overall objectives of the government. Um, so you wouldn't want uh, something to prevent competition or limit competition. We talked about that in our first meeting, you know, keeping the supplier pool as broad as possible, or uh, maybe unintentionally exclude some some group because of a score in one of these areas. So I think um, it's challenging work for sure. Definitely. And I think just, uh, again, you know, to, to underscore um, our kind of main takeaways would be you know, we don't necessarily see a need for the government to create something new. Um, we would encourage you not to, to do that, but to rather find ways, you know, like this tool to leverage what industry is already doing. Um, and then also really emphasizing the, the need for um, multiple inputs, multiple ways to get to sustainable, um, obviously with a preference for, you know, voluntary consistent standards and standards that are developed with industry input. Um, those are sort of our, our key goals and our messaging as we're, as we're talking about these issues. Okay, great. Well, if I don't see any other further questions, I'd like to, again, thank you both for joining us. And, um, I think as Boris said, all the meetings are public, the subcommittee meetings. So, uh, the more input we can get, I think the better informed we'll be moving forward. Okay. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon and Megan. Thank you, Maria, for inviting our, our guests from ITI today. So, Kristen, back to you. I can share the screen again if you'd like me to. Yeah, I guess I'd like to just defer to the subcommittee here for a second because we're at 4.15. Uh, I know we want to provide some uh, time for public input, so uh, we could either go back to our administrative business for a few minutes or go right to public input and then go back to administrative business after that. Um, any thoughts on moving forward there? I'd, I'd kind of like to hear from those if uh, there are people from the public that want to provide some input. Any aversion to going right to public input? No, hearing none. Um, so Boris, uh, would you be able to help facilitate that? I, I can't see if we have folks in the chat or any uh, public input hand raised. Yeah, we, we do have some folks uh, here who are from the public. Uh, and so what we can do is just uh, provide the opportunity now and we'll time uh, just maybe up to about two minutes or so if they have some comments to make. Um, you know, that we can do great. that now we can do it. But we can do it after also, so it's your call. If you wanna do it now, we can definitely do it now. Or, or I think we can do it. Later. I think we could do it now. And based on what we heard yesterday, I think we'll have some time for going back to our administrative items. Okay. All right. So if anyone would like to make a comment, this would be an opportunity. Who, if you're not a subcommittee member, this is your opportunity to chime in and make a comment uh, for anyone who is on the on the meeting right now. You're welcome to also submit your comments in uh, written comments, either through the chat or using our regulations.gov docket either way. Okay, I'm not hearing any, so we can go ahead and proceed with the business, uh, Kristen. Okay, great, excellent. So if we could uh, 
please call up the slide. So one of the things um, yesterday in the workforce uh, subcommittee, the team was looking at uh, ensuring they had a good mission um, statement. And so one of the things, if you hopefully you can see the screen here, uh, this, this, this language, and this is in our drive, but this is the language directly from the federal register. So I, I had wanted to go back and kind of refresh my memory about what is, you know, what is our calling as a subcommittee. And so that yellow in the middle is, is basically right from the federal register. And so the question I'd like us to spend a little bit of time discussing today is, a, do we fully understand what this means? I have a few questions. And then B, you know, would we like to use this as our mission statement or do we feel we need to refine this further for a mission statement for the subcommittee? So I think um, with that, Boris, we can go ahead to the next slide. It's bigger print for all of us tired eyes to kind of look at. Can you see my screen okay? I can, yes. Okay. So maybe to get the conversation going. So one of the questions I've been kind of tossing around in my head here is when I read this, you know, investigate ways to expand climate focus um, in the acquisition process, but while reinforcing inclusion, domestic sourcing, small business opportunity and innovation from an industry standpoint. So one of the, we'll be making recommendations to GSA, to the subcommittee, the full committee, I'm sorry, but you know, our, who is our customer? Is it, is it the acquisition process or are we being representative of industry? So I, 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 I kind of just want to have a little dialogue on that. If anyone can provide clarity on that or should we have some discussion there or is this very clear to everybody else? So, Kristen, this is Kimberly here. Sorry, I was able to get back in. And so I, I would say I'm like you that we probably do need to have a discussion. There's not a lot of clarity here, especially is this a kind of co-partnership or stakeholders in the process? Like, is it, you know, forming the what that would look like between like the federal partners and industry? And so I think we do probably need to have some discussion about what we're hoping to get out of it and then who's the audience for for it. Great, thank you. Thanks for adding some input there. Yeah, I think we need to also be aware of, of, of our role um, twofold. If we're talking about being an industry partner, looking at who are the industry partners to help um, allow us to make our points clear. That's why it's so important that we have um, these discussion groups with understanding what's the two-sidedness of what's happening in government and simultaneous what's happening in industry and to figure out in the chasm of how do we make sure that um, we're uniting these two in a way that's going to make it best for sustainability and inclusion. Um, so even like our discussion today, we, we learned more around sustainability and how the model is going to be heightened um, but really, there was no opportunity there to reinforce inclusion and domestic sourcing. <laughs> it was that was a big player conversation. But it's important for us to know that as we're talking to um, smaller businesses. I think that uh, Mr. Stevens and Nigel had indicated um, working with other federal government groups. So how do, there's the intersectionality between even within the federal government to help to make our, our mission work. So. I, you know, it still goes towards we need to have more discussion. I think we heard that from our last, I think that was Kim, but I just think um, that's my thoughts. I see that you have your hand up, David. Uh, yes, th thank you, Farad. Um, along the lines that you just spoke, um, I'm kind of thinking about this from an opportunity point of view. And if this has been discussed and I missed it, I apologize. Do we know kind of where the biggest opportunities in federal acquisition is, say, to you know, increase sustainability, reduce sort of the carbon footprint and things like that? Because it's kind of without an idea of sort of where our biggest opportunities are, I, I think that we can't really figure out which industry partnerships we should have. And maybe we'll find that there are gaps in certain industries don't have a lot of opportunity for minority owned 
businesses or disadvantaged businesses or um, other groups that we would like to help through this process. I'm not articulating it very well, but uh, I'm, I'm just sorry, do, do we kind of have an idea of where we want to go from an acquisition point of view to achieve these, say, environmental goals and all these other social goals? I don't know that we do. I think, um, I don't know that we do. And I think, you know, hearing from these speakers, we're going to be learning some of that as we go. And some of that's going to be set probably. Um, one of the sense I got from like the first couple of meetings we had was part of our part of our role was to kind of be advocating um, from an industry lens and industry being that broad, diverse group of large, small, minority owned, like make sure we look at we keep that whole supplier pool in our lens and kind of uh, truth test some of the recommendations to say that they won't create such a burden on industry to um, uh, minimize competition, exclude uh, some of these other groups, right? So I, so I just, I, I'm not sure. I think we've got to figure out kind of what is it that we believe we should be doing and we can certainly get clarification back from the, the full committee and the chairs. I mean, we're gonna go through the list of the priorities, which are more solution-based, David, like, like this is things that came up, but just from an overall, like, what are we here to do? I just think it's really important that we at least have a common kind of vision of what that is. I think, Nicole, you wanted to weigh in? I think Nigel has his hand up. Oh, Nigel, okay. Thanks. Um, so my interpretation was that we would be designing the strategies to bridge the gap, to bring the commercial best practices to the government. So if that incorporates the inclusion and domestic sourcing, yes, we've done that before. From Let me give you an example. Um, when Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana, we applied emergency uh, legislation that already existed to require domestic sourcing for an, um, local purchasing and gave additional credits to companies that came in and hired local companies to clean out debris and so forth, right? Those types of things have been applied in emergency situations throughout the government, whether it's from COVID to, you know, uh, environmental, uh, uh, nat natural disaster or something like that. How do we leverage existing policies and how do we identify those and strengthen them to incorporate it into the entire process? So it does count as points towards an award of a contract or something like that to bring a wider variety of firms to the table. And then also how do we get more of the firms for greater inclusion in domestic sourcing to participate in these industries, right? So it's not enough to say that, well, in a certain area, there may not be that many opportunities for small women-owned, minority-owned businesses to participate. The question is how do we get them into that space? And how do we encourage growth in that space? Is that something where we're, you know, uh, I see a lot of improvement in utilizing historically black colleges and universities as partners uh, now in contracting and, and whether it's DOD, I was just reading the NDAA, um, in, to encourage more people to get into those fields, those STEM fields. How do we then change our policies or drive policy here to do the same thing? So on one half, it is identifying and bringing those to the table that are already in the industry and documenting you know who where where there is diversity but then how do we encourage growth in those fields that we know are going to be growth areas for the next 30 40 50 100 years okay i i agree with everything you said but that's very i'm feeling like that's very broad um, as, as we look at this. It's one avenue we could, that as we go into the priorities, Nigel, that I think we may prioritize to pursue. Um, but, at, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit. And I think this group discussion will help us all is, you know, at the end of the day, this subcommittee's mission is to 
and it's about advising or bringing recommendations up to the full committee for GSA to consider what? Um, yeah, and then helping with the how, I think. Yeah, Matt, I think what, what I got from Mr. Stevens or Nigel was, was really around how they're, if this group can understand what um, policies and practices are available to us to help to catalyze more industry partnerships to make this work. So if there this idea of sustainability and then broadening the ocean for more people to fish um, or the access for people to fish, what are the opportunities that we have to make sure that the government is operating efficiently? So maybe that could be a part of where do we see that there's some, there's some inefficiencies in government or some opportunity in government to do those things that maybe we can help inform GSA to accentuate. Um, I do think it's when we talk around the, this Institute of Training People in Procurement, there is this idea if they're just um, non-visionary, just application, doing what they're saying, what they've been taught, where are the opportunities for us to inform them how to open their lens for not just looking at sustainability issues, for broadening it for inclusion. And if there's already things in place, how do we highlight them or accentuate them to make sure it's being done? And again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Mr. Stevens, but I do believe there's opportunities for us to learn more. And maybe these sessions are places where we can capture some of that information to make a recommendation to GSA about being more inclusive in their administration and working together with other departments. So I'd say it like this, how do we make, we make recommendations on how to incentivize the consideration of sustainability and, uh, and diversity, supplier diversity into the procurement decisions that are made by GSA. Because we're trying to bring the, those, those commercial best practices to the government. How do we incentivize incorporating that into everything that they're purchasing, the goods and purchases, the, the goods and services? I'm, I'm taking notes here because I want to make sure we capture that. Well, how do we, before, incentivize is a big word, um, Nigel. Yeah. But maybe I, measure, right? I'm not even sure they're measuring it right now. That they're, uh, so that's where I, I really like the presentation we had before. Of uh, uh, I like measuring and reporting and transparency in everything the government does, right? So I really like that scorecard. I love scorecards and keeping track of everything because you can't make a decision if you don't have the data. So the, the, the focus on the data-driven decision-making, but I don't want us to limit ourselves to you know, EPA or Army Corps of Engineers or those you know, very straightforward places where, of course, there's going to be environmental uh, considerations. It's not just environmental remediation and things like that. If we are, you know, purchasing clothing for uniforms for, you know, the Coast Guard, how is that clothing made? Where's the clothing made? What is the supplier diversity? What is the, 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 the cleanliness? What is the environmental impact of the facility where they're manufacturing? And all those can be considered points in the acquisition process. I want that to be applied to everything that the government's doing. And I know that's very broad, but how many different places can we include that as an incentive for those who are bringing the commercial businesses that want to provide goods and services to the government? Yeah, and we heard, um, I know Nicole's on here. We actually had a presentation yesterday in the workforce subcommittee um, where some of the, um, some of the presentation talked about where the government is going as far as what we buy, who we buy from, and how we buy. And so, Nigel, I kind of, I, your comments kind of resonate with that. Um, so, we're not going to solve this today. So, I think one of the things, though, we as a group have to really weigh in and kind of, we'll have to massage this down and get to a point where we're all comfortable that you know, our Northern star, everybody can follow because I think that's really important. So Nigel, if you, if you wouldn't mind, if you can get your thoughts and send them and we'll put them on the Google drive, we'll just create a mission document. People go in there, edit it, add your own value, and we'll have to keep coming back to it. 
Um, but I'm glad we had this discussion because I was feeling a little uneasy about clarity, just kind of reading this and saying, because we have a very broad uh, mandate here. So we've got to figure out to narrow it down. If, um, we have if, I could, if I could add something, I, I really, I mean, again, I said the F1 just coming in here, but a bit of a GSA lens. I, I like what Nigel was saying. I think that that sort of gets you in the right track. The, incent, the incentivize word, I think, resonated with me. And you use GSA in there too, Nigel. I think that's important to keep in mind. And we heard this yesterday that ultimately we're going to make recommendations that are actionable for GSA. And GSA just influences the whole, the rest of the government. That's the, the beauty of where we're working here in this space. But I think those words that Nigel used to me um, resonated well, um, the words in incentivizing and then the, the role that GSA plays there in, in that. I just wanted to throw that comment out there. So. Okay, good. No, I, and I think, like I said, we, we've got to, we need all brains in the game on this and input so we can refine that. And then I think Nicole's comment around partnerships, is it, industry partnerships amongst industry or is it industry as a whole's partnership with the government? We don't have to solve that today, but something for us all to be noodling on as we kind of go forward here. And I, I think uh, Nicole has a not Nicole, you might be on mute. Yeah. Indeed I am. <laughs> so just to add to that, um, what we're learning in the research is the importance of shared learning. And that's part of partnerships, but it's this notion that different stakeholders have different information. And when we engage in shared learning, this is what's gonna lead to a better solution. So I, I would really like to encourage the committee to think about this more broadly. To Nigel's point, scorecards are relevant. We have scorecards related to these supplier social issues that are already out there. We can lean on them as much as we do the carbon related scorecards and the others that are out there. We should be considering it all. Right, thank you. So, um, okay, so I think for us as a team though, like we'll get, get, spend some mental thought thinking about this and please, you know, go ahead in the document and just drop thoughts. Don't worry about pros or anything like that, but like, let's get some things on paper so that people can weigh in and we can, we can get this refined going forward. Um, if we go to the next slide, and again, this will not get accomplished today, uh, but, Farad and I wanted to kind of bring up and remind everybody, these were, if you think back to when we began and uh, they sought input, these were some of the priorities, ideas that were submitted and then kind of categorized into the industry partnership uh, bucket. And so what one of the things we definitely want to accomplish over the next three meetings, and we'll spend some time today here doing this, is really refining this list. And I think, you know, we're different people from when we started, we have more information. So I think part of it is to reacquaint yourself with this. Think about, are there things we didn't even, that should be added to this list? Are there certain things that people feel should be deleted from this list or sub uh, prioritized? And then what we'd like to do at the next session is we're gonna spend some time kind of slicing and dicing our list into categories? Is it a process improvement? Is it something that will directly impact a sustainability metric? Is it, is it a long-term kind of big level of effort fix? Is it a short-term easy level of effort? We wanna get some way to refine these down. There's no one winner, you know, we just kind of wanna refine the list down. And then from there though, we will, curate our recommendations to the full committee for the January 12th meeting as these are the top considerations that we are gonna focus on as a committee that we're thinking of focusing on. Um, and clearly from the directive of the full committee, I heard loudly short-term, you know, short-term victories, you know, we definitely wanna be identifying some of those uh, and making sure that we're hitting things that are gonna have impact, right? How can we, given our committee, subcommittee, have the most impact with the resources, time, and bandwidth we have. Farad, would you like to weigh in on this at all? And then I think we just have some general discussion on this and then, and then we can um, begin to refine. 
Yeah, yeah. I think, thank you so much, Christian. I think this is a lot of things that we've talked around today uh, covers all 12 points. Um, I did spend time, uh, we spent time talking around this, around, again, what stuff, some of the stuff is processes, some stuff is sustainability to speak to some of the comments we heard earlier. I mean, like number one, it says evaluate and address GSA's um, multiple award schedule entry challenges for small business. Well, that's an obvious process question. And so is that short-term, long-term? Is there something that we can achieve? How do we measure it? And maybe we create some kind of a matrix. If these are the 12 that we're going to have, or if it's going to be 20, or if it's going to be five. And then we want to be able to share that information with the other subcommittees. So if we're working, again, in tandem with them, as we're swimming in our different lanes, that we're able to swim to the wind and not go sideways down issues, because if they are also addressing issues around the GSA multiple award schedules. We want to make sure that there's consistency in our outcomes and so it doesn't create more challenges. Um, just like number, number four, how do we create an environment where the ecosystem of partners and suppliers collaborate on climate while competing in business? That's a sustainability issue. That's a process issue. That's an inclusion issue. So how do we, again, narrow this, these kind of things out uh, dissect it so that we can then begin to aggregate it with the whole group. And so we can start talking about outcomes and not really pontificate on industry partner subcommittees, but to be very scheduled and direct and, and make an impact. And, and Chris is going to make sure that we stay on that engineering schedule. So when we get to the, the end of this uh, this process, we'll have something to share with our, our the big group. So I would think some of the first order of business for the team is what, you know, are there things that we that we're we're not captured or that we want to add to the list? Um, and then are there, you know, again, and then we'll go through a process of take some time, review them, and then have some discussion about we can do a quick multi-vote. Boris is gonna help us with that. So, you know, if we have if we have ones that everybody kind of agrees aren't a priority, um, we can move those most move those down or even off the list, and then we can refine based on impact, doability, level of effort, uh, and then kind of fine tune this going forward. I know it took me; I had to reacquaint myself with the list, but just you know, we have a few minutes here today. I mean, are there things not on this list that the, anybody feels should be on this list, or are there any clear ones that folks? Um, want to have discussion on some of them, you know, I'm still want to make sure we're clear on what, what that, you know, each item actually is. If you all want more time to kind of evaluate the list and then provide input into the, um, yeah, Chris, the Google I think site. Chris, Go ahead, Keith. No, for, no, hey, Chris, this is Keith Tillage. You, you know, in, in refreshing um, myself with this list, I can remember the one that I actually um, uh, pointed out. And, and so uh, I think everyone, you know, has a feeling that, you know, what they put out there is pretty significant, you know. So mine is is naturally to, to, to uh, drill down on what Nigel was saying about the inclusion of small and minority business, that I want to ensure because once we put these um, these mechanisms in place, just like Nigel referenced, uh, Katrina is always just a prime example of the fact that you know Katrina did allow uh, minority and small business to be involved, but it, it, there was no assurance that anybody uh, had growth and, and grew and sustainable business, and that you can't find any of those businesses now. So, so my thing in this committee is I want to ensure that, hey, you know, we're not allowing people to go back once we put those mechanisms in place that 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 says how we partner or we incentivize it uh, and it's only on paper, right? And, and that's one of the things that that that's really important to me. Okay, good. And can I, which one was that, Keith? What was the number that the so, one so 11 um so before so you got 10 10 was in a, the incentivized uh larger entities apart but i came right back and says yeah but how do we impart to the right businesses uh uh and look for oh, okay i got truly you. want to grow right in our sustainable products and services right because gotcha. and, and again 
there are some people out there that that, that are ready DBEs that, that are for hire and they'll show up on paper, you know, for anyone. But that doesn't that doesn't help any of uh, of what, you know, I'm trying to do. Okay, and what we you. should be trying to do. OK. Yeah. And can I just add on that, Keith? The, the, look at number three, and I think that would connect well with what you just said, because the idea is the federal government acquires and spends so much money mm -hmm. every single year with government contracts that what is done by the federal government drives growth in private sector industry. So they will follow suit based on what we decide here. So if yep. we are doing things that are encouraging growth of firms, in these spaces, what we're doing is we're driving the creation and expansion of the industry mm -hmm. whose sole purpose is ensuring environmental sustainability, right? Absolutely. So that's going to continue to build on itself, even in the private sector. So the idea of how do we help build, what we're doing is help build and grow the size, scale, and capacity of these firms in partnership with the existing massive firms that have mm -hmm. economies of scale. That has to be key in what we're doing as we're talking about empowering these small firms. No, no, absolutely. And the thing, Nigel, would be this. How do we go back, you know, at the end and and grade that? I mean, what's our measure? Is our measure that that I had that particular company involved in, you know, a $30 million uh, uh, deal? Or should it be exactly what you said? How have they benefited? How have they grown? Where is, you know, the ability to compete at some other point for uh, a, a job, you know, standing on its own? That's a good point. Excellent. Yeah. So, and again, I, you know, in the industry that I'm in, in construction, you wouldn't believe the things that 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 have come across my table, right? Um, uh, that that are just insulting. And then you can't believe the amount of money that you've seen injected into an area, and supposedly the federal government has a thirty percent mandate, which they do, and these people are on the teams. But when the the money's gone. There's none of these businesses that, that are standing alone. There's none of these businesses that are, you know, most of them aren't even in business anymore. So uh, I just think it does a disservice to the people like myself that are actually out, you know, looking to build and to grow and to be, you know, a, a viable business. Yeah, Nicole, you had your hand up. Yeah. I did. I, I, I just want to punctuate this conversation because what I'm hearing is capacity building matters. This can be really important here. But what I'm also hearing is that capacity of building without an evaluative component to determine whether it's working or not means that we're not going to be able to recalibrate over time. And I think that's quite important. So I, I really, I just want to punctuate the conversation here. I think that's why it's so bold that we work closely with policy, right, and procedures because we can come up with these great ideas, but we want to make sure that it's included as a part of the policy going forward. And um, we we value sustainability, and we think that's critical because it's a given, right? So we know this administration is focused on sustainability, but equally, they've been they've been focused on on inclusion. Um, equitable inclusion. So how do we walk that opportunity to make sure that we can deliver both um, working with our partners? So I think this is a great conversation. I think, Chris, and this kind of gives us additional um, columns to put on our matrix. <laughs> um, when we're yeah, talking, when I we're think about the issues. Yeah, I agree. And it's almost it, this is great. And we still have a few minutes, so I don't want to stop. But, um, you know, so what, I, what I'm trying, and I'm trying to take a lot of notes here. So what I hear us saying is a little bit of some affinity uh, relationships amongst three, nine, and 10, but the discussion really was curating the three of them collectively into kind of a more refined priority, if, if that makes sense. Um, so I think, that might be a nice way for us to proceed. So like if we said, hey, three, nine, and 10 have similar kind of spirit to them, but what are we really trying to say here? And I think we captured some of that. Um, and then maybe there's some others that are clearly affinity to each other. I love this concept of building capacity you know, because one of the things we heard at the beginning was that GSA is concerned with a shrinking supplier pool, right? That was one of their concerns. So 
you know, from an industry partnership perspective, can we be doing things that truly grow the supplier pool for the long term is what I'm hearing some of you folks and that address the scalability of some of these um, these smaller groups to allow them to grow and, and be part you know, of the economy, not just be something on paper that gets somebody a score for an evaluation. Oh, exactly. Guys, okay. I hate to start this uh, this fire and then run, but, but I have a hard stop. I had something to come up at 445. But look, I'm really excited about you know what we're doing and, and I love the open dialogue and the conversation, all right? I'll, I'll follow up on the last 15 minutes. Okay, great. No, thanks. And I understand everyone's schedule, but so at three, nine, and 10, I made a note. Um, are there any others on here that we could quickly kind of brainstorm that kind of naturally go together that we can then refine? We'll do that at our next session. Uh, Farad and I will put some, some things together. David has his hand raised. Go ahead, David. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Um, I'm just kind of looking over the 12 and I'm thinking that maybe two, seven and 11 are kind of connected, at least in my view. And, and maybe that's more of a policies and practice question. For instance, I could imagine that whether the government does this currently or not, or it's a recommendation that we would make. And again, it's a different, different subcommittee that, you know, do we evaluate you know, companies using a social cost of carbon so that if a more sustainable technology is more expensive, we get to true it up with sort of the benefit of, of sort of their lower footprint versus a traditional provider that might have a higher footprint, but offer it at a lower cost simply because it's a higher footprint. I mean, you can go into sort of the industry structural reasons why that is. But is that kind of something that we can kind of put on the policies and practices? And it's not unrelated to this, but as I think as everyone realizes, all of these things are connected at some level. Right. But you're saying they have a stronger affinity under the policy group. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? I mean, one way to, at least one way to think about it is if you're going to try to prefer a provider based on its sustainability characteristics, and not just cost, then you might want to have a sort of social cost of carbon or some other factor in there that kind of levels up the two potential suppliers from a, let's say, a climate perspective. It's not just straight tangible dollars. It's also sort of the social cost that is hidden because we don't really price it into the price of anything. I think some of that yet. discussion came up yesterday, Nicole, as well, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're really talking about value-based decisions, value-based acquisition, as opposed to price, quantity, time to delivery. It's, it's a broader set of criteria that we're considering here. And if you focus on value, that's where sustainability and environment can really fit into the discussion. Great. Yeah, Anish has his hand up as well. Great. Yeah, B building off of what, what's already been said, I wanted to also point out number four, which is really about kind of incentivizing competition. And I feel like that ties into number six and expanding the number of contractors who want to do business with the government. So it feels to me that there is some work to be done in learning from maybe the private sector and how they're basically being a business case for sustainability. I think there's in the last five years been a lot of uh, interesting case studies there. So um, yeah, I think understanding how these co-benefits are really co coming together, like basically a business case for sustainable uh, supply chains. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. Okay, great. I'm taking some notes. And hey, I think we have about 10 minutes left. And I know Troy wanted to, Troy's been on listening, wanted to kind of weigh in. So if before, so if I could ask the group to one, really just spend a few minutes looking at these priorities and then penciling in the ones that are connected, I will get what you all said onto a piece of paper and put it in the drive so you can see it. Um, and then we'll get the agenda going for, um, 
the next meeting and we have our administrative meeting next Wednesday. So we can, we won't be making any decisions there, but we'll be getting organized for the next public meeting. Okay, Troy, are you on? I am, can you hear me? Yep, we can, can hear thank you. you. Oh, great. Um, well, uh, Kristen, thank you so much to you and Farad for just putting together a really terrific agenda and discussion today. I think it was just a, a terrific, terrific um, start to the subcommittee's business. And I'm so pleased that I was able to join to observe today um, my co-chair, Cassia Sputz, and I are going to try to observe as many of the subcommittee meetings as we can so that we can kind of help uh, uh, connect the dots across the subcommittees and um, and, uh, and anticipate um, issues as they roll up to the full committee. So I uh, just very much uh, appreciate um, the work of, of uh, each and every one of you on this subcommittee and, and look forward to the future meetings as well. Great, thank you, appreciate that. And I think, you know, you, you heard we're all uh, conscious, which is great. And we wanna stay conscious of the inner relationships between these three subcommittees and how that rolls up to the, the full commi committee as we go forward. So um, great. Well, I think it was a great first meeting as well. I'm gonna, uh, Farad, any, any comments for the group? Uh, no, thank you all for your active participation, thank you. Right, and I'd like to echo that too. I think, you know, we can only be as effective as we actively participate. And for, again, bringing in everyone's diverse backgrounds, uh, that's really the key here, I think, for us to be representative of the big word industry. Um, again, next week, we'll work on kind of organizing what we heard, how we organize that into the next meeting. Um, and we'll have two more meetings to get ready for the full, for the full committee meeting in January. So thank you, everyone. Boris, thank you. Back to you for any last minute uh, administrative. Sure. Uh, you know, and I echo that. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. So this is our second of three subcommittee meetings we're launching this week. Um, we have our third one tomorrow with the policy and practice. Uh, you, If you're not on that subcommittee, uh, you're welcome to join as an observer. Uh, and then just to, to let you know on the speaker, we're going to have a GSA analyst that has been working on single-use plastics. Uh, she's been working on an advanced notice of uh, proposed rulemaking. So that'd be an interesting uh, conversation at potentially a low-hanging fruit type of initiative for policy and practice. Uh, so that's going to happen tomorrow again, same time. Uh, if you haven't registered, let me know and I can make sure that you get the link to that. And I wanted to, again, thank all of you for participating today. Um, Christine will follow up with the homework for today and the, the time to come. Um, I feel like we're definitely moving in the right direction here. And uh, as far as our materials, we're gonna post on our committee website. So we have sub pages for each subcommittee. So you're gonna begin to see materials posted there. You're gonna see presentations, agendas, uh, as well as a copy of the full meeting uh, in a YouTube channel. So any of the members that were not around where I can be able to uh, view the meeting in its entirety. Um, my colleague, Stephanie, I would like to pass it on to you if you have any comments yourself, any um, observations, I, comments? I really don't have much. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I um, also wanted to mention, um, I know that uh, during public comments, um, uh, there was um, um, nothing um, provided, but there was there is a chat that was provided by a non sub co committee member, um, Professor Schooner. So if you'd like to uh, take a look at that, um, please feel free. Um, but again, just a, a wonderful, wonderful discussion um, and look forward to many, many more. All right. Well, uh, having said all that, uh, again, I want to thank you all, and uh, we're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.